Um, this is a result of a dialogue with, uh, with Daniele. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about laws of nature and, and laws of nature, I mean, uh, is clearly uh, a central topic in, in philosophy of science and, and metaphysics, but also clearly um, in many ways kind of central to, 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 san to science and the scientific practice. And um, we'll take a kind of uh, naturalist's broad, broadly conceived attitude here in the sense that we will be considering the philosophical debate about the, the laws of nature um, as uh, that, that it should be informed so, somehow by, by, by science, in the sense that the different philosophical positions about laws of nature should be somehow um, compatible, at least, uh, with current uh, scientific theories. And here, uh, the focus in particular will be about first uh, standard uh, conception uh, about laws uh, in the light of uh, space time, fundamental space time physics, and in particular, certain approaches in, in, in quantum gravity. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the idea here, considering the standard debates, standard conceptions about laws of nature in the light of uh, certain suggestions from uh, quantum, uh, quantum gravity in particular, not only. And a few caveats uh, to start with. Um, clearly, quantum gravity is very speculative in many ways. Uh, we have to be clear about that. And there are also a diversity for the time being of different research programs in, in, in quantum gravity. And we cannot just uh, uh, justice to the to the whole um, uh, variety of these of these approaches here. Also on the philosophy metaphysical side, um, there are many uh, subtleties related to to the metaphysics of laws, and we won't be able to 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 deal with uh, all the, the the metaphysical subtleties of these debates um, in this in this talk. And but nevertheless, they are of course uh, important. And similarly, also on the physics side are going to be many uh, conceptual issues in, in, in quantum gravity, of course, but also on the ingredient theories like quantum theory and geometry that will not be able to address. In particular, one very core issue is the measurement problem that we will somehow uh, um, um, not directly address in, in this, but should be addressed at some point. Another final point is that this is clearly a, a, a fully collaborative uh, joint presentation with, with Daniele. And sometimes, as I said, it's, uh, it results from a dialogue we, we, we have now for, for some time. And, and so somehow, the, sometimes the, the, the talk might, might reflect this and, and not be entirely um, uh, fully um, I don't know, uh, cohesive as, as, as it could be. OK, Daniele, can you move the slide, maybe? Okay, the plan of the talk is first uh, um, a few few comments about laws of nature and and, and the, the the main conceptions of laws of nature and and space time and the role of space time in these in these conceptions. Then uh, Daniela will uh, will um, uh, make uh, the the will will detail a little bit the suggestions from from certain approaches in quantum gravity about the status of space time in this context. Then we'll consider in particular um, the, the challenge from, from quantum gravity for uh, the human, again, broadly conceived uh, conception of, of laws. Same for uh, the more uh, necessitarian like primitivism and dispositionalism uh, conception of laws. Make a few comments about uh, universals as well in this, in, this, in this context. And finally, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make a few comments about kind of more epistemic perspective maybe uh, uh, about laws uh, of nature in, in the quantum gravity context. Oh, yeah, perfect. Just uh, yeah, uh, quickly, the, these, the, what we're going to, to, to say in this talk is also the result of a few projects we, we have in common with Daniele. We have a, a small uh, book project together for some time now. Um, it's also the result of a work uh, for project with Chris Wutrich on, on, the, on the laws of nature in this, in this, uh, in this uh, space timeless setting somehow. Uh, it's also the, the result of Daniela's work with uh, Stefan Hartmann. And of course, his own work on the emergence of, of space time in, in quantum gravity. Mm, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so quickly, clearly, it's a, just a, it's a setting. We will be talking about this in more detail in, a, in, in just in a moment. But there are these um, suggestions from several quantum gravity approaches about uh, the standard classical 
uh, general to relativistic notion of space time being uh, uh, radically revised somehow at the quantum gravity uh, level. And there are serious indications that even space time itself, in certain sense, we should be careful there, but may not be actually fundamental. Um, and this is something which is seriously contemplated in, 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 in current quantum gravity research. Daniela will be saying more about this, but uh, what I want to emphasize, we want to emphasize here is that regardless of the, of the, of the actual situation in quantum gravity and, and, and how the field will develop in, 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 in the, the, the next years and decades and the research will develop, there is an interesting philosophical question about the status of space-time in the, the conceptions about laws and the, 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 the philosophical uh, issue about how to conceptualize these these, these uh, approaches to laws and the, the very notion of law of nature um, in, in, in a context where space-time uh, might not be might not be fundamental. Next slide, Daniele. Yeah, thanks. So as we will see, most standard conception, at least uh, realistic conception about laws, rely on space-time in one way or another. We'll be focusing mainly here in this talk about uh, humanism. So this idea that we have I'll be talking more details about this, but you know, this the, we have the distribution of facts like the human mosaic and and, and laws just to prevent on, on this that the in in for instance they can be uh, conceived as the the theorems of the of the of the best system in a, in a certain sense um, in the so no necessary connection in this in this context in a kind of more primitivist conception that they are taking as as being primitive in in, in themselves. Or in the dispositionalist uh, setting, they are the result of certain uh, uh, disposition or dispositional causal understanding of properties, for instance. And in the universal um, understanding of laws, there are uh, there are uh, relations about uh, among uh, between universals. And, and in, for instance, if you take the the, the, the conception of uh, Armstrong, are taken as uh, the universal are taken as repeatable features of the space-time world. So clearly, there is also a, 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 a link, the a role of, of space-time in this in this concept. But we'll we'll come back to this in, in in more details. Just a note, a comment before proceeding, that there are two kind of perspectives about laws uh, that are um, that are relevant here. And first, we'll be mainly focusing on the kind of ontic or realist objective conception of laws. So laws are being things out there in the world, either with you being reducible to the human mosaic or things in themselves out there in the world, like the primitivist conception. Uh, these, these are kind of the main realist conception about laws, but they're also the kind of more epistemic perspective about laws. Like, yeah, something not really out there in the world, but more the result of the, 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 the certain uh, agent construction. As it's uh, put it here, and we'll 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 see that maybe this this is of some relevance in the in the quantum gravity context. So the question of interest here in this talk is, if space time is not fundamental for certain for certain reasons, we'll 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 be discussing just in a moment. Uh, the the question is now, how are laws to be conceived in this uh, in this in this context? Uh, of course, one uh, first intuitive uh, reaction is just to be saying, okay, if space-time is not fundamental, then um, the uh, space-time somehow uh, and, and space-time somehow emerges at some level, as uh, as it has been discussed both in philosophy and, and, and in physics, of course. Uh, so just uh, the laws will be will be uh, emerging as well. But then uh, uh, we. we there are several questions uh, in, in, in this in this in this uh, in this strategy is that first the laws will be approximate in, in notions in a certain sense, and we can still ask about uh, whether at the quantum gravity level uh, there are laws. And if if we take laws to be emergent, then it seems that there are no laws at the quantum at the quantum gravity level, and um, this might be this might be. Uh, an unwelcoming, uh, or maybe that's something we have we have to accept in the end. But um, it seems natural in this context trying to to reconceive uh, an understanding of of laws of, of laws of nature that is somehow um, compatible with uh, with the, with the quantum gravity um, context. And moreover, 
uh, there are general situations, maybe contemplated by, by, by physics again, where space time is just not there, even in the quantum gravity context, where space time does not emerge. We will be discussing this with Daniele. Um, that I don't know, uh, certain phases where uh, non geometric phases where there is no uh, there is no uh, space time, but still physics want to say something about phase transitions between phases where uh, space time might not emerge. And again, we'd like to conceptualize somehow, uh, or, at or at least we would like to explore to what extent we can conceptualize uh, the notion of, uh, of law of nature in this, in this, in this context. And we will see, and this is an important point, I'd like to emphasize that the standard conception of laws we'll be discussing, humanism, this primitivism, this kind of conception, already to some extent face uh, uh, tension uh, at the level of the, uh, what we call here the ingredient theories, namely quantum theory on the one hand and, and um, uh, general relativity on the other hand. Okay, now we'll be talking about uh, uh, just giving you some more uh, details about how uh, space time uh, disappears first in, 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 in certain understanding of, of GR. Yeah, so I take over and I try to discuss a bit uh, the progressive way in which uh, space and time disappear more and more going from general activity towards quantum gravity and in different ways, uh, different levels uh, within different quantum gravity approaches. So the, uh, I just recapitulated a few main lessons of uh, general relativity. Uh, uh, I've been told uh, to, to emphasize that uh, some of the things I'm going to say are not necessarily consensual. Uh, there, there may be some controversy already here, but uh, so be it. Um, so we learned uh, from generativity that uh, geometry is genetically non-flat uh, and most importantly, it's dynamical. Uh, is the actual physical system, the actual dynamical object that the theory is about. And uh, the causal structure uh, is uh, almost uh, uh, equivalent to the geometry. So uh, if the geometry is dynamical, so is the causal structure. Moreover, neither in the theory, in the definition of the theory, nor in any specific in a genetic solution, uh, there is any preferred uh, uh, time or space direction. Going a little bit more uh, into the technicalities of the theory, uh, one way to understand the, the, the implications of diffeomorphism invariance uh, is, to, is to realize that uh, the differentiable manifold on which we define our theory does in fact have any physical significance in itself. So what doesn't have physical significance are the points in the manifold, the directions in the manifolds, and uh, needless to say, coordinates and similar things, similar structures on the manifold. Um, so the way in which uh, we have to give meaning to events as well as to time and space directions is by uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, relations or coincidences or properties of the dynamical fields that uh, we initially define on the manifold. So in particular, one way to construct observables and to give a meaning to a notion of a local region and uh, time evolution in general activity at the different variant level is the so-called relational strategy. Um, by which to use uh, some of the dynamical, physical degrees of freedom of the theory, for, for example, uh, an appropriate number of matter fields, uh, as a physical reference frame. So to, def to define for you a set of rods and a clock, and in terms of that, uh, you have a notion of local, only in terms of that, you have a notion of localization in time and space, and therefore of evolution or change in time and space. Because these are physical, systems, uh, then the definition of localization in time and space that you get uh, is in fact only approximate. No physical system really behaves like an ideal clock and rod. Uh, so the definition would be only valid in some special regime in which the reference frame is uh, sort of uh, idealized. Uh, so you have to neglect, for example, the back reaction of the field uh, that you're using as a reference field as a clock. Uh, or as a, uh, as a rod uh, onto the geometry itself, uh, onto itself uh, and other fields. So from this point of view, one could already say that uh, space and time are approximate notions in, uh, in, in general activity. So there is already a certain disappearance of the usual notion of space and time from Newtonian physics in, in general activity. And this is on top of being dynamical. 
And I uh, made a quick sketch on uh, the, the bottom of the slide of what it could mean to, to have a relational time evolution, the situation which just have uh, the rich scalar and uh, scalar field. You invert the scalar field for the time coordinate, uh, so to give a definition of time, and then you insert it in the Ricci scalar, so to have a, a different variant observable, which is the value of the Ricci scalar for at a given value of your clock, uh, which is the scalar field. Anyway, already here there is some tension with certain accounts of laws, and again we will discuss it later. Uh, and things get in fact worse. Huh? the moment you uh, go to the quantum level, and not only because as uh, Vansan already mentioned, that there is already some tension with quantum theory in itself, uh, with the usual notion of laws, uh, but because uh, when, you quant when you go to the quantum space-time level, uh, things of course uh, are even less uh, um, familiar. Now, the first step uh, is the conception of quantum gravity as just uh, you know, quantized general relativity. Uh, you take the classical theory, you apply a procedure, you obtain uh, a quantum version of it. The key point here is that you're not changing degrees of freedom. You're still dealing with the same dynamical fields of general relativity, metric and matter fields, so you just treat them at the quantum level. Well, just is a big, uh, well, I need a lot of quotation marks. Uh, and that carries with it immediately, it brings with it immediately you know, superposition, that is some form of indefiniteness of geome geometries and causal structures, uh, non commutativity of geometric observables and of causal features of the world. Uh, it will bring entanglement across uh, uh, dynamical degrees of freedom of your theory, including the geometric ones. And in practice, it means that no quantum state can ever encode precisely the full set of properties that define in a classical GR, space, time, and the causal structure. At best, uh, you are going to have a semi classical stage that do that uh, approximately. Uh, moreover, the physical frames, uh, and therefore all the relationally defined observables uh, that uh, uh, one could argue in GR uh, define time and space, uh, become then quantum. So, this is an additional set of complications. Uh, uh, to the ones uh, present already in classical GR. So one could say the space time disappears even more. This quantum gravity as quantum GR is the uh, perspective of all the traditional approaches uh, from the 60s, 70s, and, and later canonical geometrodynamics, the covariant path integral, and so on. None of them at the moment is considered to be uh, developed to satisfaction, uh, meaning that. There is a certain consensus that they can be only used in some semi-classical approximation or for formal manipulations. Uh, then there is also asymptotic safety, which is a bit different, but it, it would fit in this uh, broad category, although it's still a viable approach in, in, from any perspective. Things get worse uh, the moment the quantum gravity approaches uh, uh, do not just quantize GR, but will introduce uh, a new set of uh, degrees of freedom. So the new degrees of freedom of the theory are pre-geometric or non-spatiotemporal in the simple sense that, that they are not uh, the fields of classical GR that you use to define space and time, uh, simply quantized. They are something else. If that is the case, then geometry and space-time should emerge uh, from the collective uh, uh, dynamics, uh, collective properties of such new degrees of freedom in some appropriate new approximation. So it's not just a classical approximation, it's a new continuum, call it approximation. Uh, you still have all the quantum oddities, but you have you even lost uh, the, the picture of uh, you know, the initial degrees of freedom you had started from in, in GR. Uh, so this continuum approximation is truly a new conceptual and mathematical direction to explore. The new degrees of freedom depend, of course, on the specific quantum gravity formalism you, you consider. Uh, in general, they take the form of some form of discrete or singular uh, geometry, so piecewise flat, or maybe causal sets, which are also some way of discretizing the geometry, maybe distributional collection, connection fields, and so on. The precise distance with the smooth fields of GR, therefore, with degree of freedom in the various uh, formalism. I give you a couple of examples uh, focusing on, on a specific subclass of approaches. Uh, 
there are a number of approaches to quantum gravity. I named three, canonical loop quantum gravity, spin form models, uh, group field theories, in which uh, the basic degrees of freedom are spin networks. Spin networks are at best uh, uh, degenerate or other, other um, in, in some other way, uh, singular geometries from the point of view of uh, the smooth geometries of GR, uh, but they are actually different in all this uh, formalism. In, in canonical LQG, in the traditional approach, uh, you start from embedding uh, graphs uh, with data in a manifold and then taking the equivalence class and the diffuse, which means that you have additional relations following from uh, the embedding and following from the properties of the continuum connection in GR that you want to sort of maintain for these new degrees of freedom. And this gives a certain definition of the Hilbert space, uh, which is sort of closer to, although still different, to the continuum connection field of, uh, of GR, so, uh, which is itself uh, uh, another way of expressing the geometry, the metric. You can go even more abstract with the same spin network states and treat them as purely algebraic combinatorial uh, structures with no embedding information. And in particular, you may not include uh, these additional equivalence relations uh, that uh, keep them sort of uh, hooked uh, uh, you know, linked uh, to the continuum connection field of uh, classical general relativity. So you're farther away and you are in fact closer to what happens in simplicial quantum gravity when you have uh, piecewise flat uh, geometries. You can go even more abstract and even farther away from uh, uh, continuum GR uh, by taking the same abstract spin networks uh, as purely algebraic combinatorial structures and embedding uh, states associated to closed uh, graphs uh, into a Fox space of building blocks uh, so that you even need additional operations to have any form of connectivity between them. And I will say more about this uh, um, additional operation later on because it, it could be of interesting conceptual uh, consequences. The point here is simply that uh, you can write down a, 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 an even more, um, well, a different Hilbert space, which is a standard Fox space like in field theory, where the quanta are these abstract building blocks of space, and all the rest is uh, collective uh, uh, entangled, uh, uh, you know, correlated uh, uh, states. Okay, the key point of all this brief uh, survey is that the moment you change degrees of freedom, there is a new direction that you need to uh, follow in order to recover GR-like structure. And this new direction is not a classical approximation. It's truly a new type of uh, path, a new set of uh, uh, problems that you have to tackle, mathematical and conceptual. Underlying all this story is also a key interpretative uh, point. You may argue, you may take the perspective that all these new degrees of freedom, these new mathematical structure are simply regularization tools. That's viable, it's okay. And many people in the community take that uh, point of view. And then uh, at the technical level, many of the issues are the same. You still have to tackle the continuum approximation, you still have to study collective dynamics and so on. But you will start asking questions about physics or philosophy only in the limit. And where you are in that limit, you are in the previous level of quantum gravity that I mentioned, that of quantized general relativity with quantum metric, quantum matter, and so on. If you are instead more, um, I would say, uh, bold and, uh, uh, or uh, uh, you, you are prey of your own hubris, then uh, the, uh, you take seriously these new structures as, as physical uh, and uh, uh, existing in some sense on their own. And then there is a, a large set of new conceptual and mathematical issues that appear. And in this sense, uh, space and time disappear even more. In particular, when you take a continuum limit from your atoms, of uh, quantum gravity, your basic building blocks. Uh, well, the continuum limit in general will give you different phases, uh, phase transitions, uh, a, a large number of additional, uh, at least mathematical uh, situations. And if you gave uh, a physical meaning to the atoms, you have to start asking what is the physical meaning of all these uh, uh, phases, including those in which you are not able to, to extract uh, general relativity and continuum physics. 
Okay, so the first conclusion that space and time in quantum gravity are not uh, reliable, uniquely, precisely defined, or absolute structures. And they're not, uh, uh, you know, this type of uh, uh, reliable concepts uh, in, in a quantum gravity setting. And things can be even worse. Uh, the space and time may disappear altogether from the fundamental description of the world in quantum gravity. And I stop here for now. Now, um, so we, we, we have this, 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 this survey now of the different ways and, 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 and the, the different layers uh, where, where space time just uh, fades away somehow. And the question is, we, we want to discuss here is, is, is what's, what's the, the impact of this on the standard conception about, about laws. We'll start with the, an obvious candidate for, for, for uh, understanding laws is, is the, the, the standard human conception. And, and here we just want to say a few words about the, the role, the, uh, the obvious role of space time in this, in, this, in, this, in this conception. I think the general ontological picture is, is pretty clear. We have the, the, the kind of fundamental human basis of non moral facts, categorical facts, the, the so called human mosaic in, in a certain sense. And everything else, as Lewis put it, for instance, everything else, including the laws, causation, supervene on, on, this, on this basis, on this mosaic. Um, and typically, this this human basis ontologically can be understood as a kind of distribution uh, of um, uh, of fundamental intrinsic properties over space time. So these perfectly natural, in Lewis sense, uh, properties over space time. Those so the space time distribution of all these uh, these these facts. Um, clearly, in this picture, there is no necessary connection. There is this principle of free recombination, which is uh, which is at the heart of this of this uh, conception. And, and space-time relations uh, famously play a crucial role. They are kind of world-making or grooming kind of, of relation to be sure that we are we are in the in the in the in the, in, in, in the same world. Now um, th th it, there is a there is a famous challenge from from physics from quantum theory in particular um, that uh, quantum entanglement relations or, or non-locality relations somehow do not correlations do not supervene on uh, on, on the human uh, basis understood in, in terms of this special temporal distribution of, of intrinsic properties um, this this has been raised as a challenge to the to human supervenience in particular and to humanism in 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 in, in more 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 generally also clearly the, the, the humanism and super human supervenience has have to be has to be uh, distinguished Clearly, a possible move in this, in this, um, uh, in this, with respect to this challenge, is just to include somehow the different ways to understand this. But one, one obvious way, I won't go into the details, but the strategy is interesting. It's just to include these, these quantum relations in the human basis. So to enlarge the basis, to include these new natural uh, uh, relations in in the basis, makes the basis, the human basis, somehow less local in a certain sense. But still, um, the, the, these relations can be can be understood as as categorical and non-modal in, in a certain sense. And we'll see that once we go to, to to try to consider quantum gravity, the quantum gravity context, this move can can um, can can be can be meaningful. Um, okay, so can you move to the next slide? Thanks. Then, once we now move to the quantum gravity context in the light of what Daniela said. We clearly see an obvious crucial difficulties. Is the question is okay? We see that this this the standard ontological characterization of the human mosaic is in terms of space time. Clearly, there, there might not be space time in, in certain regimes. So, how can we characterize this uh, this human basis in a context uh, without space time? And in particular, one clearly we can take a kind of more abstract perspective about the human basis, and we will consider this move. But one. One, one issue there is going to be about the, the, the world-making relation, the glue. Remember, we, we, need, in, we need something which, uh, which makes sure that we are in the same world somehow. In, in the, the stand-up context, it's clearly space time relations playing this world-making or gluing role. Um, the, the question now is, uh, we, if we don't have uh, space time, so what can play um, this, uh, this uh, gluing role? Knowing that this it has to be clearly categorical, non-modal, in a in a certain sense. Um, 
uh, uh, I want to mention here at this at, at this stage uh, an alternative kind of more epistemic uh, perspective on laws. The, the, this kind of second vein I, I, I mentioned in the introduction. We can just here say, okay, uh, this is maybe too weird. This notion of physics without space time, laws without space time, and we whatever whatever quantum gravity says about the phenomenal level without space time or whatever. There need to be some kind of experimental evidence located in space time at some point, and we just need to take these experimental evidence for quantum gravity, which uh, presumably will be again located in space time. Uh, so deviation of certain of certain things we can observe, or, or traces in the CMB or something, as somehow the, the, the basis for uh, for the, the the quantum gravity laws in the in the human sense and 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 um or in an epistemic sense sorry and and we'll we'll, we'll develop uh, this uh, we'll come back to this to this kind of more epistemic perspective uh later on now we want just to to see a little bit the consequences of uh, this possible disappearance as suggested by of space time as suggested by certain quantum gravity um, approach uh, now a crucial question is how to characterize this human basis without space time but of course, uh, this will depend now. If we want to consider a concrete proposal, this will depend on the on the on the the, the, the concrete quantum gravity approach we will be considering. And Daniela just gave um, uh, a few hints about um, the, the kind of picture we get in in, for instance, in in GFT, a um, kind of rather radical approach to 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 the to the quantum gravity uh, issue, um, but. What is interesting, and he mentioned this, uh, that several approaches in quantum gravity and GFT included suggest quantum entanglement as a kind of um, grooming, possible grooming relation. In, in GFT, for instance, uh, he just showed in, there is a very precise te technical sense in which uh, quantum entanglement uh, plays this, this, this grooming, grooming, grooming um, uh, relation. And the interesting thing is that maybe uh, entanglement can be taken as at this kind of world-making relation for this non-spatial temporal uh, characterization of a kind of generalized uh, human basis in the quantum gravity context. And I, I think, Daniela, you, you can uh, substantiate this a bit more. Yes, indeed. So the idea that the space entanglement is some, somehow the, 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 the glue uh, out of which we build the space-time has been suggested in various contexts. Uh, and in the context I mentioned earlier, these of uh, spin networks or quantum gravity states uh, coming out of gluing together building blocks, uh, each with, a, with a, the interpretation of a fundamental simplex, uh, a small cell. Uh, this is particularly direct uh, because the very notion of having a graph with several nodes is in fact uh, uh, the result of taking building blocks and gluing them together with, uh, across some entanglement pattern. And this is, technically implemented. So the basic connectivity is in fact directly some primitive entanglement relation between uh, the fundamental quantum gravity degrees of freedom. So the adjacency between the simplest is dual to spin network vertices is directly the entanglement between the degrees of freedom on the vertices. Uh, and even uh, some uh, basic geometric quantities or proto-geometric quantities at the discrete level, like uh, the area of a triangle dual to the link uh, is proportional to, this, to a measure of entanglement between the two set of degrees of freedom. The volume uh, that you associate to each cell is, a is proportional to a measure of entanglement across uh, the degrees of freedom on the four uh, phases in the boundary of a tetrahedron. So this idea that uh, space, time, and geometry come out of entanglement relations at least as a very simple realization at this discrete uh, level. Daniel, do you want to um, elaborate on this, or should I should I make this? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Then, um, uh, the, the, the idea then in this, uh, so we have we have now the uh, we have now a possible hint about how to characterize the the, the human mosaic in a non-spatial temporal in certain non-spatial temporal sense, or at least we have an idea uh, of a possible candidate for a, a gluing a world-making relation. And in this context, then laws would be we can just try to run the same machinery in the sense. That laws would then be um, uh, theorems uh, of our best uh, of our best uh, system uh, 
um, uh, best systematization, if you want, of this of this uh, generalized human uh, uh, mosaic. There would be the theorems of the of the best uh, quantum gravity system, uh, the, the, which which make the best balance between, for instance, uh, strength and, and and simplicity, something something like that. The usual machinery. Um, the, the, something we should be careful is that. Uh, uh, we just mentioned that the fact that the, 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 the underlying human uh, basis mosaic, um, as well as the, 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 the theorems themselves, somehow shouldn't refer to, to, to directly to, to space time. And, and typically, uh, the, the theorem of the best system would be statements about kind of theoretical entities, and in certain sense, would be clearly undermined by, by observation here in, 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 in this context. And the task here is to clarify again. What is the what is the mosaic as we, we've tried to to, to do, um, and uh, uh, we would just mention the fact that uh, the quantum correlation quantum entanglement could be could be a candidate for the the gluing the gluing the gluing the world making relation uh, in this in this characterization. And then uh, once we have one we have all this we see that uh, when we when we run the the the, the, the space time uh, emergent. Thing we, we can have in a in a in a technical sense uh, space time emerging from these uh, from these uh, quantum entanglement relations um, and similarly then uh, once we have uh, in the hypothetical case that you have a clear picture about the the, the space time emergence from these from these uh, entanglement relations we have hints about that then we will have the say the usual human mosaic somehow emerging uh, from the from these generalized uh, kind of quantum gravity human mosaic characterized by the gluing entanglement relation. That would be that gives you a little bit the the the, the idea how to frame at least um, human humanism in a, in a general sense in this in this uh, quantum gravity context. Can you move to the next slide, Daniela? Yeah. Now, thanks. When we move now to the um, the, the, the other family of, of, uh, of um, conceptions we want to consider today, kind of primitivist dispositionalist conception of flaws. Again, we won't go into the, deep, the, the metaphysical details, but we, we will first address, discuss quickly the general topical picture. It's pretty clear there is, in both cases, there is a kind of irreducible primitive modality you want to accept, to take as, 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 as a starting point. And this should help you to give rise to the whole uh, special temporal distribution of, uh, of facts. So from this perspective, it's highly unsatisfactory just to accept the whole human distribution of facts. You want to take a, sub a subset of them and then accept some kind of primitive modality which give rise to the rest. In, in, in the primitivism a la Modlin, for instance, you have fundamental physical laws of temporal evolutions taken as, as, as ontological primitives uh, doing the job. In the dispositionalist camp, you have the law has been grounded in the dispositional or causal nature of, of properties, for instance. There are, again, metaphysical subtleties, but I think the, 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 the general strategy is, is pretty clear. And the, 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 the way they rely on, on space time and on, on, on time in particular, on certain temporal uh, uh, structures, is, is also pretty clear. Um, and this is even clearer once uh, these conceptions are articulated within the initial value formulation as they often are, for instance, uh, uh, as, as done by, by Tim Morlin. Here is a quote, the total state of the universe is in a certain sense the relative. That's, that's really something taken as positive. You don't need to accept everything. You just accept the initial state, for instance, plus the laws and you have everything else. It's the product of the operation of the laws on the initial state. Okay, there's this notion of production here. And the argument in, 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 in Tim's um, yeah, conception, for instance, typically is that uh, you, you are entitled to, to accept because the, the Laws are doing a, a so much a job for you. They grant uh, physical possibilities. They, they can grant counterfactuals typically. In and and there is a very clear procedures for grounding counterfactuals. For instance, they are understood in terms of uh, Cauchy problems. For instance, you there is you just take an initial value formulation in in a, a, a la general relativity. For instance, and 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 you you foliate your space time. You you construct Cauchy data corresponding to the antecedent of your counterfactual you want to evaluate. You run the, the laws and you see whether the the counterfactual is true or not in this in this in this world. This is super clear. It's it's really robust and solid in a sense. 
But clearly it relies on a temporal notion of production there or governance sometimes in the metaphysics uh, literature. And this is, uh, this is central to, these, to this conception. Maybe next slide, yeah, I just, yeah. So clearly this temporal structure underlying a primitivism and dispositionalism is, is, is already in tension uh, with, with the picture uh, proposed by, by GR as by John Twitty as, as, this, as, as uh, suggested by, by Daniele. Okay, in the general case, in the fully dynamical uh, setting of general activity, already at the classical level, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have necessarily fixed global topology. And uh, uh, so we don't, in the general case, we don't have uh, necessarily uh, the possibility to, 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 to construct an initial value uh, problem for, uh, for general activity. It, you need to assume typically global hyperbolicity, at least the existence and um, and the unicity uh, theorems uh, assume uh, uh, a global hy hyperbolicity, and but this is in the general case this might not be, this might not hold. Uh, now, just a, a side point, a side remark, uh, a nice feature of of the of, of TR in this in this setting is even if you assume global hyperbolicity, hyperbolicity so you have a, a the possibility to foliate your space time, then the nature of the of the constraints in, 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 in GR are such that they may not allow to construct prescribed Cauchy data uh variables, leaving everything else the same in order to evaluate counterfactuals in the sense of mode of Tim uh, Tim modeling in, in the way I, I just described. Um, because of certain technical, technical, uh, technical, you can you can price this to certain technical features at the analytical level. Once you make the the, the conformal decomposition of the constraints, this is not this is technical stuff. But what is interesting is that this 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 connects to a real problem also for uh, for people working in general activity, for instance, trying to make sense of the LIGO uh, experiments. You need to construct uh, uh, prescribed Cauchy data corresponding to an initial value from uh, to, uh, to initial corresponding to certain initial data you want. But doing this is really a tricky problem because uh, if you want to uh, um, if you want to to modify certain uh, data, then you don't you don't on a on a hypersurface you don't exactly know. Uh, because of the nature of these constraints, what will well, what will change uh, in your in your in your in your uh, initial data? So this is a, a tricky issue, and here again, it's it's um, it's related to the ultimately to the dynamical nature of of, of space time. Move. We can move to the next uh, slides. Thanks. Okay. Now the the central. Uh, uh, if we if you want to try. To, to articulate these conceptions in the context of quantum gravity, where space time, as we as we as we suggested, might not be might not be uh, might not be there, then we can try to identify a central non-human somehow intuition that is at the heart of these conception. And as I said, one intuition which we want to keep somehow is that there is a subset of degrees of freedom of quantum gravity degrees of freedom and. And, and, and together with some kind of primitive modality or, or nomic glue, name it how, however you want, they give rise somehow uh, the, the, the rest of the, of the quantum gravity facts. That would be a kind of trying to capture a little bit the, the, the non-human intuition underlying primitives and, and dispositionalism at the level or in the context of, of quantum gravity. Of course, uh, clearly, it's obvious there that there's a crucial difficulty is to articulate this kind of non-temporal notion of production in, in, in this context without, without space-time. Clearly, in, in, in Tim Morling's picture, uh, the, 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 his, his understanding of production, nomic production is, is, is purely temporal. It's related to, to time and he's willing to accept the, uh, this um, uh, uh, quite explicitly. Now, if you want to articulate a kind of non-temporal notion of production in the quantum quality context, this could be tricky. It's not not completely hopeless, but it's it's non-trivial. We can maybe look at certain quantum gravity processes uh, that could inst instantiate a certain notion of non-temporal production in terms of spin networks or GFT or spin form GFT transition amplitudes, for instance, between certain states. Um, or uh, we can try to endow with fundamental disposition certain kinematic uh, structures like spin network structures endow with certain dispositions giving rise to the to the rest of the quantum gravity facts that would be a strategy 
But clearly, this strategy seems to rely on certain non spatial temporal distinction between kind of kinematical structures with having certain disposition or, or with, with the form of a law, from the modality giving rise to the, to the dynamical, the full dynamical uh, structure. But we, of course, uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can wonder to what extent this, this distinction of kinematics dynamics is still meaningful at the quantum gravity level. And uh, there are already attention at the, at the geo level and has been discussed by uh, Ellis, for instance, and others, but um, then it, it, it more, yeah, in general, the dynamics is, 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 is given by us uh, in GR in a, a set of constraints. And, um, and the observables have, have no, as, as Daniele discussed, have no time uh, um, uh, dependence, uh, explicit time de dependence in terms of which you can, you can uh, define a temporal, uh, uh, clear temporal evolution. And as I said, the, the, the very initial value uh, formulation might not be, uh, might not be uh, possible, the, the initial value uh, problem might not be well posed. Um, yeah, do you want to say? Yeah, you... let me just, yeah, I just uh, mentioned uh, one point. So, of course, uh, imposing the dynamics or taking into account the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, uh, of geometry and matter fields is crucial in any quantum gravity approach. And uh, in, in the approaches that uh, use uh, spin networks as new degrees of freedom, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the histories, the possible dynamical processes of such uh, degrees of freedom have a, a very similar algebraic combinatorial uh, um, nature. And so they're again, not spatial temporal in any usual sense. Uh, but in terms of those, one can define what would be an algebraic uh, combinatorial analog of a path integral in a, in a quantization of GR. Um, and, and then study how the transitional amplitudes uh, between uh, quantum gravity states uh, behave with respect to the uh, dynamical conditions, uh, the conditions, the equations that uh, impose the dynamical uh, feasibility of the histories uh, taken from uh, classical GR or uh, you know some more general uh, dynamical condition. And the only point I want to make here is that uh, uh, on top of uh, implementing the dynamics uh, in, the, in the construction of such uh, quantum gravity amplitudes, one can also construct different type, uh, types of quantum gravity amplitudes, uh, and in particular, construct those uh, or identify those uh, that possess uh, some form of uh, intrinsic ordering between the arguments, that they're not symmetric and uh, exchange of, uh, you know, uh, state one, state two. So in, in this sense, uh, they, one can see the ordering as sort of a protocausality property or some sort of a temporal asymmetry even in absence of time, at least a sort of a seed out of which uh, the usual notion of time and causal relations will emerge uh, in the appropriate uh, continuum approximation. So uh, it's this type of seeds that one has to uh, look for if one, if one wants to implement uh, in, in a quantum gravity context this primitivism uh, uh, account of uh, laws. And then, uh, yeah, still uh, me, although we are still in the metaphysics uh, domain, I mean, uh, let me say just something about the universals account. So uh, if one takes uh, uh, laws uh, to be necessary relations between universals and themselves uh, as part of the fundamental ontology of the world, uh, maybe surprisingly, uh, uh, this general definition, this general schema is, uh, uh, can be adapted to a quantum gravity context, provided that one understands the fundamental ontology underlying quantum gravity formalism, despite the fact that it's not based on uh, space-time. So the, the difficulty would be instantiating these necessary relations uh, in, uh, in space-time. Uh, but that's uh, one can see that as the metaphysical counterpart of the problem uh, in the physical domain of uh, controlling the continuum approximation, the emergence of space time and so on, which is something that of course everybody uh, works on. Um, but the point is that the general scheme would apply uh, and in order to support this view, uh, what is missing is uh, really uh, uh, clarifying in detail the fundamental ontology and uh, what are the necessary relations uh, partially read out of the theory itself uh, that uh, you, you can, uh, you can um, deduce. 
for this uh, um, at, at this, uh, this basic ontological level. Now, uh, the, 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 I just mentioned two points here. So one is that uh, part of the task uh, of the difficult task of clarifying the ontology behind quantum gravity is uh, clarifying uh, how do you uh, define individual entities how what what do you mean by uh, distinguishing entities without space time given that uh, the usual route of uh, distinguish them uh, through their localization in space time uh, by definition will not be uh, available that's one this in principle uh, uh, can or uh, could be solved, uh, but the, in itself, uh, going to quantum gravity will, cert will not help uh, against the general metaphysical objections against the universal account. Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the difficult aspect uh, uh, is the uh, necessitation. I mean, the, this uh, necessity relation among the universals uh, has to be not only uh, identified, but justified. Uh, and this is very hard. I voice uh, the possibility that uh, uh, this type of uh, necessity uh, is somewhat uh, inevitably uh, only attributed uh, on an epistemic uh, basis. But then, of course, it means that you leave uh, the, the, the metaphysical setting of uh, the universal's account. And so it's not really a solution of the problem for the account, but rather the uh, reason to go to a different type of account of laws. So before doing that, uh, in conclusion, I, I, I just uh, state the conclusion of this brief uh, survey of possibilities. Uh, I would say that uh, um, the key task in all these accounts of laws uh, uh, to generalize them in, uh, in the, to, the, to the quantum gravity context of both primitivism, primitivism, humanism, and universals is to clarify the ontology of the, of the theory. Uh, or to say differently, to uh, build uh, an ontology without uh, space time so that it can then ground uh, our notional laws. Because that's the logical uh, scheme of these accounts. Uh, you know, the, the notional laws is uh, grounded on the ontology of the world. And the, the, the problem is that that ontology is grounded on space time from the conceptual point of view. So this is what we have to achieve. But uh, in terms of the general scheme, I think that, that there are several indications that uh, uh, laws of quantum gravity within such schemes could be defined, even in absence of uh, space time at the fundamental level. And to conclude that I, I say something about the other uh, alternative uh, uh, to, uh, view on laws, uh, which is uh, to see them as epistemic uh, constructions. So there are a number of uh, arguments one can uh, um, put forward uh, uh, to support this view, to uh, in favor of this view. Uh, but in fact, uh, there can be additional quantum gravity considerations that uh, suggest this perspective. So um, in one, one uh, example could be in fact already uh, in, the, in, the, in the, within humanism, uh, when you try to improve on the best system account of laws uh, in going to the so-called best, uh, best system, uh, one could argue that the additional elements introduced to uh, counter objections against the uh, best systems account are in fact uh, epistemic elements. And when you include them, uh, you are really into an epistemic uh, account of laws. Uh, uh, maybe similar, if not uh, identical, to the so-called anti-realist uh, positions. Uh, so from, from the point of view of such epistemic view on laws, uh, then the laws of quantum gravity would be, of course, peculiar, because as a physical theory, quantum gravity would be very peculiar, but not particularly weird from the point of view of uh, uh, epistemic uh, account of laws. Uh, so quantum, the quantum theory of gravity will be the result of the construction work of epistemic agents. Uh, like any other theory, it will have a mixed uh, normative uh, representational uh, use. Um, and it will be uh, simply, uh, first and foremost, uh, a successful explanatory scheme for our interactions with the world. This is what justifies uh, trusting a theory or working with the theory. Uh, uh, most of it, however, will not be directly related to experiences. Uh, and I, I comment here that, in fact, the fundamental physics models nowadays rarely are. Only uh, you know, a subset of their statements is directly related to experiences. 
uh, most of its statements uh, uh, will be in fact uh, you know of a more hypothetical character and certainly refer to theoretical entities um, so the uh, the uh, the support uh, for such statements uh, will then be found in their explanatory power and uh, whenever possible in their uh, empirical support uh, that is once more in epistemology which is exactly what the uh, epistemic view of laws uh, would uh, amount to so uh, from the perspective from this perspective clarifying the ontological structure of the theory will still be of course uh, very useful but to the extent in which it will improve uh, the explanatory power of the theory itself, uh, to the extent in which it will contribute to our understanding of the world and our actions as uh, epistemic agents, but it will not be a prerequisite for a consistent characterization of laws, uh, because laws, uh, this account, uh, are not uh, grounded directly on the ontology. Uh, they remain purely epistemic. So the conclusion from, is that uh, uh, an epistemic view on laws uh, could be, uh, in fact, more flexible to adapt to the absence of, uh, of space and time at the fundamental level. And, and now the key task is to add a, a scheme uh, with explanatory power. So to build a theory with strong explanatory power, despite the fact that it is remote uh, from experiences and severely underdetermined uh, by observations. Then laws will be grounded in its uh, epistemic virtues, so to speak, and, uh, and so grounded will be its uh, suggested ontology, uh, uh, coherent with such uh, epistemic virtues. In order to accept that, however, one should be willing to accept uh, the uh, fallibility of the uh, ontology itself. And uh, I think we can conclude, uh, and thank you for your attention. Uh, so let me start with, uh, with a general uh, question about uh, your, your very interesting discussion. And the question is, um, how, um, let's say, um, pivotal is uh, the problem of the, of the laws of nature in the context of uh, quantum gravity? Let me explain. It seems to me that uh, the whole discussion that you have uh, provided can be subsumed under the more general issue of, uh, let's say, finding a hallmark of physicality in a, a non spatiotemporal ontology. So the idea is that it's not sufficient that you just say, hey, here I am, my tetrahedra, my atoms uh, uh, of quantum gravity, and this is my ontology. There must be uh, also something to that ontology that makes it uh, physical as opposed uh, uh, to a just mathematical construction. Okay, so this is, uh, I think, the main problem with uh, non spatiotemporal ontologies uh, in quantum gravity. Now, isn't it the case that uh, once this problem is addressed, uh, the problem of laws of nature in the context of quantum gravity is uh, basically settled uh, in the sense that then uh, all the camps, uh, Jungianists, uh, dispositionalists, etc., will just adopt that, that ontology and adapt their uh, views to that new ontology and that's it so isn't this just a subcase of this more um general problem clearly clearly thanks antonio for the question very interesting clearly clearly the two the two issues are uh, the physicality issue and the, the issue of the, the what are laws in this context are related I, I i grant you that clearly but they are distinct i mean once you have as you said once you have articulated an ontology, a, non in a kind of an ontology, a physical ontology in a non-specific temporal context, you haven't said uh, what are what are what could be laws in this in this in this setting. And let's assume that you have kind of an ontological picture of 
certain, I don't know, quantum gravity, quantum gravity degrees of freedom, no space time there. Then uh, our talk would be, and, and the, the work with Chris also would, would be showing that it's non trivial then to articulate the, the usual standards uh, conception of laws. There would be more work to be done in order to articulate these standard conception, numinism, primitivism, these kind of things in this uh, space time less context this is one thing and the other thing is maybe it's uh, too costly in a certain conceptual sense that you would just uh, go for a more epistemic understanding of laws or just get rid of the notion of laws uh, altogether at this level this kind of move but this is an additional work to be done uh, and this is distinct from the question of the the how to characterize the deontology of the of the of the of the of the physical world at the quantum gravity level. If I can add the comment, uh, I, I agree with what uh, Valsan said. That the uh, you're when, when you make a okay. So if your statement is uh, once you have an ontology underlying quantum gravity theories, uh, then uh, the, the various account of laws uh, could uh, be applied, uh, and then there's not so much new that uh, would have to be done. Uh, with respect to the usual accounts. Uh, to some extent, uh, I, uh, I think I agree and we agree. And that's why, in fact, one of the points we, we mentioned. In a sense, we say in this ontology based account of laws, uh, uh, we can see ways in which you can adapt each of them to quantum gravity, uh, the, provided that you clarify the, the underlying ontology. So, from this point of view, uh, I think uh, I agree. But uh, indeed, uh, uh, this is one way in which uh, the, uh, you, know, you can try to address the issue of laws, uh, and it's not the, the only one. You can take indeed uh, an epistemic uh, character in which the ontology can help, clarifying the ontology helps because it adds uh, explanatory power, but it's not uh, a prerequisite. Uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, uh, things start uh, with uh, trusting the theory which is uh, done on a different basis. So trust in the theory and trust in particular the statements he makes uh, also beyond the space time picture is uh, in itself, uh, regardless to what you think of laws. It's, uh, you can ground it on uh, empirical facts. Uh, if that's the, the way you do, you can ground it on, on other criteria. You can, you can justify by other criteria, but again, it's a different issue. So uh, developing and then trusting, uh, increasing the confidence in your theory is a certain issue. Once you do that, uh, you have to tell me what, uh, what attitude towards the laws uh, you read out of the theory is. And depending on what is your attitude, what you do is different. OK, thank you. Um, just a quick follow up. Uh, I didn't want to imply that they are one and the same problem. I want to say that one is a byproduct of the, the, the former. So. Uh, but but yeah okay I mean I I, I totally see your point. Uh, so they're, they're certainly strongly linked. On this point, you're certainly right. Uh, I'm not sure exactly if one is necessarily uh, you know linked uh, to the, to the other or they a priori they could, you could not care about one and just care about the other and so on. I mean that's a subtle and more second order discussion, so to speak. No, okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, next in line we have Pedro. Uh, thanks, Antonio. Um, thank you, Van Sam and Daniele, for this uh, actually very interesting talk. Um, yeah, okay. I have um, a sort of you know, comment. I mean, I'm coming from theoretical physics. Um, I have this sort of mindset that basically laws of nature and, and what is fundamentally, it's usually taken to be basically what is uh, smallest in, in terms of uh, length, uh, in this case also. Uh, higher physics, we say that, okay, so more, more fundamental is basically what is uh, shorter distances and correspondingly high energies. Now, given uh, this, uh, okay, given that I'm now doing this uh, PhD in philosophy and physics, I'm basically getting uh, basically a broader picture of what uh, fundamental and basically by product, I mean, loss of nature might actually be. So I think actually quite intrigued because I mean, the point that all your approaches in, in terms of loss of nature in your talk are decidedly reductionist, whatever the case, but they basically 
uh, shared at that point. So uh, lately I've become interested, of course, it's not that I fully agree, but interested in so-called uh, priority monism. So, which is basically that, that the whole is basically the most fundamental structure and somehow everything there is, is basically uh, depends, everything else depends on that whole. So of course, in, in this, uh, what I'm saying that, because in this case, one by construction, I mean, wouldn't have this problem of uh, non-special temporal entities at the fundamental level, because in this reading, the fundamental is by default space, space time. Uh, we need to get into, let's say, space time. So, of course, there is a clear problem here. I mean, it's not that we are basically sidestepping all difficulties that basically you've been raising in your talk, because uh, the fact remains that there actually might be non special temporal entities, even if in this. Uh, different reading, they are not fundamental, but they they actually may exist, depending, of course, as Daniel is saying, one take canonical or epistemic uh, view on those entities. But in case you do take it as, as ontic ones, okay, the fact remains how to get from the more fundamental, I mean, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole universe, as, as it were, to those parts. So I'm just wondering because I'm, I'm trying um, to basically see how one should get, and if somehow this may ease all this, uh, not necessarily technical, of course, I mean, I think that's really to face the same problems, but perhaps conceptually, whether you've basically given some thought to the idea that basically taking the, the fundamental to be the cosmos, I mean, could is some um, philosophical, in terms of uh, what Bansan have is uh, dubbed building relations, world building relations from the whole to, to, the, to the parts. And so, so a very general comment. Um, uh, uh, let me just make a comment, uh, Bansan, and then you, you can quip in. Um, I, I was not thinking of adopting any particular reductionist uh, perspective. Uh, so maybe I can rephrase the, the problem in a, a non-reductionist uh, manner. So uh, give me your uh, uh, fundamental theory description uh, picture of the world. Uh, turn it into a list of statements. If uh, uh, fundamental meaning, I mean, whatever scheme you adopt to tell, to say what is in the world, and uh, I don't care if it is, uh, you know, uh, the, the high energy or uh, low energies, uh, microscopic, macroscopic, if it's collective or uh, or uh, individual, uh, it's uh, so. If in this uh, description, space time doesn't appear. Uh, uh, space and time localization is not present. Maybe just for the fact that because your whole is not localizable in space and time, then I think you have the, the problem that we, we, we try to focus on. Um, uh, that, so I think it's, it's more general than any specific uh, uh, picture in terms of uh, no, the building blocks uh, or, or, or fundamental physics uh, in the sense of uh, very high energy or microscopic physics is really, if you, in your picture of the world, the space and time doesn't uh, appear, can you say that your picture of the world has identified laws of nature and what are those laws? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's what I was saying that it's not that basically adopting this uh basically whole as basically the, the, the fundamental structure is gonna basically get rid of uh, the issues exactly. because- So is, the, the issue is more general. It's, uh, it's, uh, now we phrased it maybe in a certain perspective, but it doesn't require it. Yeah, that, yeah. so, but yeah, my, but my comments were, I mean, technically speaking, I mean, if you, um, I think that basically facing the same, but I don't know, perhaps this is, uh, something that I'm ignorant of. I don't know whether uh, philosophically speaking, I mean, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, world building relation, whatever you wanna call it, uh, 
may help assess. This is something that I'm trying to figure out myself. I mean, yeah, this letter. So it's I'm just sharing basically my my, my words with you because the talk basically goes to the heart of, of all this. So. Yeah, that's he, said, he said that philosophically speaking, so is uh, Van Sander should uh, comment. No, I mean, uh, if you okay, if you take priority monism, uh, priority monism as a as 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 a starting point, then I guess um, yeah, there's a lot of issues there. I mean, that the, you should look at the literature in metaphysics about the 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 the, the, the priority monist thing. And and there, I guess the, the the kind of flaws we're interested in, in would be would be about the about the, the how 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 uh, the parts uh, uh, emerging from this from this from this from this whole would would interact with one another and how how this this is uh, systematized in a certain sense. So um, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, I think that it may actually help what basically you are proposing, you both, I mean, in terms of this gluing relation, basically as a kind of entanglement relation. But this need not be a basically at the usual theoretical physics at small scale, I mean, high energy physics. So you basically could try to build, uh, because what basically is in the literature, I mean, uh, in theoretical physics is just basically at the fundamental level you take entanglement relation and try to deduct space time from there but basically you you may try to do the opposite in, in said so in in the sense that okay it's not that entanglement gives rise to space time necessarily if basically the fundamental is that it basically that you could base your gluing so to speak in terms of this entanglement at, at the and at, the, at the level of, of, of the universe. So, uh, what is entangled? Sorry, what is entangled in that case? Well, this is this is something that I am uh, I, I I don't get from the literature because I mean, as far as I know, I mean entanglement has been just uh, in the lab. I mean, empirically speaking, basically. Uh, uh, basic, I don't know, perhaps some hundred kilometers. No, no. So it's not, it's not that the whole universe is, is. Uh... Well, I agree. no, 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 I'm fine with that. But the, my my point is just that uh, you know, by definition, entanglement is that you have a, you have entanglement if you have a state which is not a product state, but in a field based space which is a tensor product. So you need to identify two subsets of degrees of freedom that uh, are entangled. So it's always entanglement between something. And uh, if you say uh, right, the level of the whole universe, no, of course, no I mean, no, 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 sure, I mean, sure. The whole universe, the whole universe, uh, the whole universe itself is, is not entangled. I don't think the whole universe exists, by the way. But sorry, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what you mean by the whole universe, anyway. But <laughs> oh yeah, okay, that's. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, okay. You put all your degrees of freedom uh, in the same bucket. Yeah, that that's that, that basically what what. But what, then you're a reductionist because you're defining the universe from the building blocks. Pedro, Pedro, just maybe uh, you should have a look. There, uh, there is a, a, a nice, nice work, a nice paper by by uh, Ismail and Schaffer. And these people about they typically have a, a, a monist approach to entanglements, and and this is a this is a very nice nice paper. So they so the idea of grounding uh, entanglement in a in a kind of monistic approach. So that would typically go in 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 the kind of deep direction you're suggesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Dylan Smile and 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 Schaffer. Okay. Uh, yeah. I will. Thank. Thank. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, next in line, we have Joanna. Uh, thank you, and hello. Um, uh, I would like to ask you uh, about uh, Russell's uh, conception of loss. So um, you uh, suggested that it um, uh, it's uh, there is there are no 
significant problems uh, with reconciling this view on laws uh, with uh, quantum gravity because um, um, this view doesn't presuppose um, that universals and individuals have spatial temporal nature. Uh, but I'm uh, I'm worrying uh, whether uh, this view on loss um, fits too well to uh, even the less advanced physics. And uh, I'm uh, I just would like to ask you um, what do you think about the difficulties uh, that I'm going to uh, present. So. Uh, for Armstrong, uh, Armstrong considers laws that have the form something like um, f of x implies g of x, uh, which he analyzes as the universal f necessitates the universal genus. And, um, and I'm wondering how to uh, how to analyze uh, uh, in this way, for example, the Newton's second law. So uh, first, this relation of necessitation uh, is asymmetric, but if I write down the equation, it is symmetric. So it's not clear to me what necessitates what here. And uh, Another issue that I have is um, how to think within this view about uh, the differential operator. Uh, is that yet another uni universal or something else? Uh, it's it's very unclear to me. Uh, uh, and I hope that maybe you have some suggestions. Uh, yeah. Um, the, what, what, thank you, uh, Joanna, for your for your question. I think what you're uh, pointing at are quite general uh, issues with, with respect to universals. They are not specific specific to the to the quantum gravity case. I think they are they are quite general issues, and I think they fall into the. The, the, the generally, I think it comes from Van Frassen, but there there's these two big objections against the, this this view that the one about the, how to character characterize this necessitation relation among between universal and the other one is um, uh, is is what's the what's the relationship between the, the exact relationship between universals and individuals. Um, that's basically the, 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 the two main uh, issues with this kind of is with this kind of um, of approach of understanding of laws and what you're what you're raising is typically about the how exactly to identify the the, the relation the necessitation relation between universals I guess about the your 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 yeah I mean I, if you take Newton's law I think that there are always ways to you can reformulate you, even on a logical on from a logical perspective there are, um, a game to be played there where you can try to reformulate uh, these statements in in a, in a certain sense such that they have the right sort of form for 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 uh, using armstrong uh, armstrong um, take on it this this kind of thing i guess could be could be done and yeah but the, I'm not sure to what extent it really helps with the, the, the these two core problems which have been raised in the literature and 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 and, and which are the, the, the worries you you're you're pointing at are to me our instantiation of these of these of these two of these two worries with respect to 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 universals. Would you would you agree with that or with my characterization of your your issues being kind of uh, instantiation of these these worries uh, relating to the identification characterization of the of the of the relation of the necessitation relation between universals i'm not sure actually because uh as i understand these problems they are more 
metaphysical problems and my problem is uh, uh, more like how to apply this framework to a particular case like <laughs> in this particular case what is what in Armstrong language so uh, for example this problem with the differential operator that occurs in in many laws of nature uh, I don't see how to characterize it in terms of Armstrong's view and uh, but I also don't see uh, whether this is related in any way to this uh, standard attractions. I think that the move by Armstrong would be something like, uh, you know, uh, identifying what is the universals behind the, not the differential operator itself, but the differential operator acting on the function, which is basically some fundamental change. Uh, so you would say something like, okay, there is a universal, uh, which is in fact a change of a given quantity. Uh, and there is a statement about that change, which is the necessary relation that I identify. Uh, the problem then is what Ansan said. I mean, what, 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 how do you actually characterize this necessity? In what sense do you have necessity? And uh, is this identification you made of universal unique in any way or uh, no? Yes, okay, you found one correspondence, but uh, how, how strong is the link? Uh, and these are general issues with the universal's account. Maybe this is a good point to make a clarification. Uh, just to, I, I don't want to be put on record as somebody who endorses uh, the, the universal's uh, account. I try to, to disguise uh, my actual uh, uh, opinions about the universal's account uh, in my presentation, and, but I ended up uh, somehow claiming that the universals are great and the, their application to quantum gravity is uh, without any trouble. I mean, I, I, my statement is actually that uh, the extremely problematic universals account and uh, by far not convincing doesn't really receive too many additional uh, uh, problems uh, from any uh, application to quantum gravity because the problems are at a different level. And uh, the, the, the fact that space-time disappears, uh, well, is not the first of them. I hope it helps. Okay. Um, so, but I have a follow-up on that. And I'm not sure of what you said, that uh, this account uh, is uh, less problematic in the sense that in a space timeful context, we have a clear sense in which um, universals are abstract entities and physical entities are things in space and time. But in a space timeless context, how should we consider our space timeless ontology with the Perhaps addition the of, of universe? So, it's, it's more directly abstract because you don't even have to make the step from uh, instantiated uh, objects. But, that you but then, the but ones. then, Daniel, this will be Platonist. It's not my fault. <laughs> I, I didn't <laughs> propose the account. So, but I'm I, I, saying that uh, it's, uh, it's it's not. I think it's Platonism even uh, without uh, the quantum gravity story. I mean. It's already Platonist. But that will become, I think, even more radical because now also our fundamental physical ontology is made up of abstract entities. So my point is that, yeah, in the end, uh, this I is, think, uh, I think, more problematic. I don't know, Vansan, what do you think? I think we, we, we mentioned this and we discussed this with Daniele also while making the slides. We mentioned this in a, just in a line about uh, raising the worry that it, 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 it's precisely what you're saying, Antonio, it's, it might be difficult in the quantum gravity context, as suggested by Daniel, to articulate a, dist a distinction between individual and universal, which is, which, is, which is at the heart of the conception, of course. And as you said, uh, one way to characterize in the standard way this distinction is typically the individuals are space-time located, uh, in a single way somehow, and the, the universals are 
uh, depending on the conception you have of universal, um, they, they are uh, multi multiply located in, in all these, these different individuals, for instance, these kind of things. But of course, you need you need this distinction in the first place. And if you don't have space time, articulating this distinction uh, could be could be could be could be difficult. Uh, I agree. And this is this is a, I think this is an interesting feature of the 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 the, the quantum gravity take on this on this uh, uh, debate about. My point is just that it's not obvious to me that uh, uh, this issue, which is the issue of uh, defining an ontology without space-time, uh, is uh, so much better or, in fact, much different in, uh, in the other accounts. So part of the problem of defining uh, an ontology without space-time is uh, this uh, distinction uh, uh, defining individuals and, uh, and identifying individuals and so on. And yeah, of course, it's different in different uh, perspectives, but it's already there for all the other accounts. It's not unique to the universal's account. Then, okay, I leave to you to judge uh, the degree of uh, complication at the metaphysical level. But, I mean, yeah, I leave it to you. Okay, thank you, Daniele, for this defense uh, of the position. Uh, Enzo, is your turn. Yes, thank you very much for your very, very interesting talk. I have some um, very, very general question. Um, the first one is uh, about primitivism. Uh, I think that it is possible to uh, outline primitivism in a very generic way, like something against regularism, against humanism, without a clear uh, clear-cut uh, ontology. In this case, it seems to me that uh, uh, the problem of uh, space-time is not uh, there because uh, it's clear that uh, a very generic kind of primitivism, primitivism is not committed to the fact that uh, primitive laws must be somewhere in the space and time. They are very general notions that could be could be applied in different contexts without this kind of, uh, of problem. It's, it's, this very generic form of primitive, primitive is only the issue that uh, regularist is not a good uh, way to look at uh, reality. Uh, it, uh, it, there is something more. Uh, and uh, without an, a commitment to a, a peculiar ontology with space time. So uh, I, I would like to understand if you agree about this uh, point. This, the second point is connected to this. Uh, um, I cannot understand uh, how one can um, in general uh, endorse uh, Lewis' point of view without modal realism. It is clear that it is clear that if we are modern realist, uh, uh, this point of view is uh, is a, could be a good one in the sense that there is a sort of uh, individuation of what holds in many different contexts uh, su sufficient a sufficient big set of contexts. On the other hand, if one is uh, constrained to only one possible world, the hour that we are attempting to understand, again, I, I, I cannot understand the regularist point of view in general humanism because uh, uh, beyond the problem of space time, in the sense that uh, we have to explain the success of science. So uh, this is connected to uh, the final slide uh, of, of uh, your presentation, where you say that uh, in general we, we the, the point of view, the epistemic point of view, is more flexible than uh, the ontological one. I cannot understand why the, the form of primitivism that I presented at the beginning seems to me very very flexible. It depends. It is a, 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 a very generic issue of uh, anti-regularist position that could be applied in different contexts on the basis of the kind of physics that emerge from our our investigation. So it is very flexible and in general also in quantum gravity it seems to me that uh, 
emerged problem of explaining the success, the, the, the eventual success of the theory. Says that uh, in, in, in any regular position, uh, except the one by David Lewis, David Lewis, you have not kind of justification of uh, project your generalization of the future or the or in other situation. So it is very, uh, from an epistemological point of view, is very uh, naive, it's very difficult to accept. I cannot understand how it is possible to defend this position. So uh, it seems to me that uh, mm, the problem space time, when you mm, make a, a very generic uh, statement about uh, uh, what are laws, uh, mm, goes a bit in, in the background, in the sense that it depends from uh, the result of our, of our uh, research in, in uh, in quantum gravity. A final uh, small observation. I would like to know your opinion about what happened in string theory, where uh, I cannot understand uh, in, in what measure, uh, in what measure space time is uh, a construction based on uh, worship, or on the other hand, are something fundamental. And uh, about to your account of scientific laws, what happened in this context, in your opinion? Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, is it me or you, uh, Valsan? Uh, I, I can make a yeah, I can make a couple of comments. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, to the extent in which. Uh, Okay, let me put it like that. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I don't know enough of what uh, uh, the, uh, the ontology behind uh, primitivism uh, uh, that is uh, you know, not resting on any space-time notion could be, but uh, so this is just my lack of knowledge. But to the extent in which uh, one can formulate it, then uh, of course I have to agree with you. The moment you have that type of uh, uh, basis uh, for formulating your account of laws, uh, and you're not indeed relying on space time, I, I would certainly agree that uh, you are flexible enough already to account for uh, quantum gravity laws, for laws of quantum gravity. In a sense, that's the, our uh, one of our conclusions that uh, that's the task. Once you are successful with that. Uh, there's no specific issue with uh, adapting uh, your conceptual laws uh, to, to quantum gravity. So that's uh, uh, one, one, one comment. Um, and another comment, oh, oh, okay, so one, one, one other comment was uh, about uh, uh, how you would uh, how you end up justifying the success of a particular quantum gravity theory. Uh, and you were some, some how arguing if I'm just correctly that you know a, a primitivist uh, uh, perspective would, would help with that uh, uh, would, would explain the success uh, and and from an epistemic uh, point of view that would be lacking and uh, I, I think I agree but the point is that from an epistemic point of view you don't need to explain uh, the explanatory success of a theory that is uh, uh, grounded in uh, you know either in pure uh, epistemology not in uh, any other um, uh, at any other level at least that would be my point so maybe i just explained too much of the physicist here i mean if uh, if i have a theory that uh, is uh, Know, empirically uh, corroborated and uh, it has a number of other uh, epistemic virtues that's it i don't need to uh, uh, necessarily have a further justification in, in a sense uh, uh, is, is for me it's a bit more the other around uh, the, the, the the a given ontology uh, imposed on uh, reduced from it from a theory that is so successful in the previous sense would, uh, would be only useful if it improves further this uh, epistemic success, not uh, not uh, not the other way around, so it will not help. Uh, it will not help explaining the success of the theory, and it doesn't need to. But uh, again, I'm just uh, stretching my, my myself too much already. And uh, uh, concerning string theory, I'm not so sure I understood what the, what, the, what the question was. Uh, um, so you were for, you were referring to the worksheet formulation of uh, string theory first. Uh, uh, and can, can you repeat your question so I, I can try to 
yes, yes, say something about it. Yes, I, I cannot understand whether mm -hmm. in the worksheet formulation of the theory, mm -hmm. space time is something fundamental or something be, built on the worksheet. In okay. The second, I, the second case, uh, your, 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 the problem you raise for for uh, for what for for for, for a laws uh, is not there. In the first case, yes, I would like to, to know something. Okay. About yeah. It. Yeah. Okay. My 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 impression about uh, the worksheet formulation of street theory is that uh, in that formulation space-time in the form in the usual form of a metric with gr and so on is in fact a given because it enters uh, the, the formulation as a, as a parameter uh, which, and then you constrain it uh, by requiring a certain symmetry on the worksheet which is the conformal symmetry and the, the result of that constraint that you impose uh, I mean that constraint resulting from this uh, imposition takes the form of some generalized uh, Einstein's equations so you say that, well, that set of parameters that in fact is the space-time geometry cannot be arbitrary, it has to satisfy certain conditions because of uh, conformal symmetry. But uh, from the point of view of space-time, we are not really much farther away than, uh, than, uh, than general relativity. That's why that approach is considered the background dependent formulation of string theory and you have to somehow go beyond. What is space-time in string theory more broadly intended? That's a different... Uh, topic and I think that uh, one way or the other is in the same class uh, as the formalism I, I described except that there is less of a precise uh, still tentative but less precise uh, concrete proposal for what could be the fundamental degrees of freedom that's the sort of respective advantage of the two classes of formulations I mean all these approaches that I mentioned there is a clear candidate and there is a huge problem in uh, showing the emergence of usual space-time and GR and, and so on. In string theory, uh, you start from a much more, uh, from a formulation that is much closer to usual GR because you, see, you keep using a straightforward generalization of uh, fields uh, and geometry and so on. But then you have the opposite issue of trying to identify what could be the non-spatial temporal, more fundamental degrees of freedom. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's my impression. Uh, Vincent, do you want to add something? No, I think I agree with uh, what uh, Daniel said. Just very br briefly about the primitivism. Uh, sure, yeah, that's always a possible move. You can accept just uh, whatever, whatever your physics seems to, to be saying about laws as being primitive. But then I think Tim Modding is, is quite interesting in, in this respect. He's, he's saying you're entitled somehow to do this as long as you can show the work this is doing in terms of explanatory power and this kind of things. And he has, he has then his own construction about, uh, about contractual, this kind of things. Uh, you can ground all contractuals using uh, primitive laws and so on. And somehow you should be able to articulate this also in the, in the space-time less context. This is one comment. And the other one is just what you said about the explanatory deficits of humanism is, is right. I mean, this is something which is uh, widely acknowledged. Then there are different strategies, but this is this is a general a general objection or, or, or worry with respect to humanism. Uh, it's not specific to the quantum gravity case. You're uh, you're right. Thanks for your comment. Thank you very much. Yuliush. Hey, uh, apologies for the background noise. Uh, I'm traveling, unfortunately. And thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I have a kind of high level question that I never thought about previously. So maybe it's obviously silly, but so the sort of conceptual landscape you guys presented is kind of like, we have a new physical context and we have all of those kind of like all the accounts of laws of nature. And we want to see how they kind of work out in this new context. And my question is, do you think there's, there are prospects for some like qualitatively new account that we perhaps would get only because we're looking at this new physical context? So like, for instance, there's little physical motivation for thinking about priority monism unless we have something like entanglement or global properties in cosmology. And so in a way this is like, it's not truly new account, but it gets new motivation because of this new physical context. And I wonder whether like this, we could get some new addition to this old conceptual landscape of accounts of laws of nature by looking at uh, this new physical context of quantum gravity. 
if that makes sense. Hi, Julius. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, um, I think thanks for the question. I think it's uh, this is a good point. I, I, I think this is not something we have uh, directly uh, uh, considered, but I, I think this is not something which can be excluded. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean the new physics uh, of quantum gravity could 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 somehow suggest a, a new a new take on, on 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 laws. And yeah, I think this is something we should uh, we should. Uh, we should we should not exclude uh, from from the very start. No, I agree with you. Yeah, that is uh, something which is. Yeah. Let, let, let me add just a couple of comments. So I also agree. Um, it ties to a few things we, in fact, I didn't mention, but we could have mentioned. So first of all, uh, we said that in, in the caveats uh, that there are already issues with you know quantum theory, and there may be things that come from 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 there that may affect our thinking about laws, uh, and we don't address them. The further thing we didn't address is that uh, uh, you know, quantum gravity can affect our interpretation of quantum theory and of cosmology and a bunch of other issues in foundations of physics, uh, and then uh, further affect uh, through them the, the, the views on laws. So the, uh, the, basically, we, we try to be as limited as possible in our approach. We just said, OK, let's take uh, existing accounts. Uh, without uh, trying to guess what could be alternative ones uh, following quantum gravity and simply uh, try to see if they can be adapted or what happens if you remove the space time from them, which is the main suggestion coming from quantum gravity, assuming all the rest. Because, uh, you know, in, in building, in trying to interpret quantum gravity models, we're also making assumptions and we try to stay as close as possible to the lesson of GR as close as possible to the lesson of, to the main points of quantum theory. And all of that is already controversial, uh, already uh, subtle and could be affected by the end result. Uh, and uh, that's one comment. The other comment, uh, uh, which is that we said, okay, space time has to emerge in some approximation. This is some form of continuum limit, uh, collective dynamics and so on. But we didn't say much about that. The point is that it's clear that therefore the relation between whatever is the original entity and uh, the, the more fundamental or non-spatial temporal entities and space time is very similar to the relation between uh, you know constituents and uh, you know collective uh, um, and so the whole point uh, there are a bunch of issues in the foundations of physics we have to do just with the very notion of emergence with complexity with uh, you know and laws uh, as it was mentioned uh, by pedro i think uh, the, uh, in his own comment uh, there's a bunch of additional issues that will, may affect our notion of laws uh, which have to do with our standpoint towards the relation between collective and uh, constituents uh, between uh, emergent and fundamental uh, uh, reductionism uh, complexity all of that and that may well affect the way we, we define laws uh, also in this quantum gravity context. And so once we have a better picture of how space time emerges and what is the, the role of all this uh, collective behavior and so on, it may also change our perspective on what laws really are in this scheme. They don't have to be necessarily the relations or the properties of the constituents of space time. There could be a much more subtle relation with the with the overall scheme. Okay, thank you. Um, next in line, we have Pascal. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether do you think that we can make sense of a notion of stability or invariance without the um, a, a, without the. Um, the notion of uh, without the notion of space time, because if we can think about stability or invariance without uh, space time, then I was wondering if you have had a look to Mark uh, Lange account of laws of nature. He proposed, Mark Lange proposes that uh, accounts for laws of nature in terms of counterfactual invariance. So, and he gives a unified view of laws of nature and the difference between uh, the laws of nature uh, of the special sciences and uh, of fundamental physics is just a matter of degree of invariance. 
it's invariance with respect to what? Uh, Which transformation? Well, he says invariance with respect to counterfactual statements. If it is just a semantic uh, definition, then I guess uh, you know, to the extent in which you can translate uh, a theory of quantum gravity, regardless of the actual objects it refers to, into a list of statements, then you can apply the, the, the same account. I'm not sure how much it actually helps, but you can probably apply it. If it is just about that, then, uh, then yes. But, um, but I have the impression that uh, you know the whole thing makes sense uh, when the invariance that you translate at the semantic level is in fact uh, some form of stability under time evolution or changes yeah. of context. Uh, and, but in, and that type of uh, translation will not be available. So if you can avoid that uh, uh, reference, then yes, you can apply to any theory in fact. Yeah, and uh, yeah, my second question is uh, whether why you don't uh, why would you resist if you do um, this uh, view that model that yeah we should just think about of science in terms of models without laws that uh, Ronald Gear proposed by back to the 90s I guess yeah I mean this is a uh... To answer your first question, uh, we, we haven't directly looked at the specifics of uh, Marc Lange's uh, uh, conception of laws, but I guess, as Daniele said, in principle, uh, could be adapted to the to the to the, this context as well in a certain sense. It's very and, similar uh, to sorry, Vincent, It's very similar to to, is, is, uh, to what I was referring to as epistemic view, and and in fact, it's very close to to what I what I actually think personally. Just that uh, it's. Uh, well, we couldn't cover everything and it doesn't require necessarily much uh, adaptation. So in, in, in a sense, it was our concluding statement that whenever you go to this more uh, anti-realist or epistemic uh, perspective, uh, you, f you gain some form of flexibility with the, with the usual limitations of this account, but you gain some flexibility that could be put to, to use in the quantum gravity context. Yeah, and about your other point, I think, yeah, this is also something we we considered in the sense that not 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 uh, get a specifics also, but but the idea that maybe we should um, we should just get rid of, or maybe the, the very concept of law of nature is maybe of of no of no relevance at this in this context. This is something uh, which, which which also need to be to be considered uh, in, in 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 this context. Yes. Yeah, or maybe also Van Frassen's approach to laws of nature in, ter in terms of symmetries, you know? There's all this book, in, uh, I think it's a, a long book, I don't remember the name, but laws of nature as symmetries or something like that. His, his view is that, well, laws of nature is just an historical um, const human construction and what we actually seek in science is symmetries, which is quite close to invariance. That's why I'm not completely sure if we, we yeah, if um, we are not able to describe um, quantum gravity just in terms of invariant invariances. So what I said about Giri, as far as I'm concerned personally, would apply also to Van Frassen. I mean, in, in all this, uh, the, the, I, I, there are authors and accounts that I like very much myself, and I, it's what I sort of group together in a broad uh, epistemic or anti-realist type uh, perspective, and uh, which, which again, I'm, I'm totally fine with, uh, with, with differences and small caveats here and there. And concerning symmetries, uh, Okay, I, I give you a theory. Uh, then I find that uh, at least a good part of it is dictated by symmetries. Okay, then I can declare it's a definition that uh, the, 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 the laws uh, as uh, encoded in the theory are those corresponding to, the, to, to those symmetries. Okay, fine, it's a, it's a definition. So the point is that uh, uh, the, the, the definition of the theory may not be simply uniquely determined by a list of symmetries. 
and uh, a, a super stupid example is that I can I can give you a bunch of symmetries like Lorentz symmetry, some form of locality, and I don't know a number of discrete symmetries, and still have an infinite number of possible terms in the Lagrangian. Uh, so I, I didn't specify the theory that works in the world. Uh, so theories may be underdetermined by, by a certain uh, symmetry uh, assignment. That's the first comment. The second comment is that uh, for all the models of quantum gravity I know of, uh, it is not the case that we control exactly what are all the symmetries or, or what are the relevant ones. We know in GR, that's well defined and under control, but the moment you go to the pre-geometric uh, level and it's not just a quantization of GR, well, what are the relevant symmetries will depend a lot on what are your new degrees of freedom and you need a number of other classif uh, clarifications. The moment we have a theory, maybe we will realize that there are clearly a clear set of symmetries that almost determines the whole structure of the theory. But at the moment, I, I couldn't tell. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if you want to add, uh, no? Uh, okay, so uh, a very last comment I wanted to make is that um, uh, regarding, uh, you know, the possible uh, um, failure of the concept of uh, law of nature in a non spatial temporal context, I was thinking about um, stripping uh, the idea of law of nature to its uh, conceptual bare bone which I think boils down to the external versus internal way of putting things. So um, there are physical goings on. Now, either there is something external to these goings on that determines these goings on, or it is these goings on that determine the, the law, okay? This is, I think, the most simple kind of uh, difference we can draw in the, uh, in the debate. Now, I don't see how this kind of difference can be revised or even undermined in a non-spatial temporal context, unless we want to place a very strong spatial temporal uh, notion of uh, determination. So if you think that whatever the, let's say, direction of determination is, it must be spatial temporal determination, then yes, of course, in a non-spatial temporal context, this external versus internal um, uh, distinction crumbles down and we have no notion whatsoever of law of nature as being determined or determined. But aren't we in this case placing too strong uh, a constraint on the type of uh, determination uh, involved. What do you think about that? Yeah, this is interesting what you're saying. I think uh, it's right to the points. And if you look at the, the concrete articulation of how the laws, for instance, determine the, 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 the going on, the, then the, that's what, what we're saying about primitivism or disposition, for instance, that there is some, time, some, some kind of uh, temporal uh, structure involved. Uh, the, 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 these people are using uh, something like the initial value formulation. By the way, Ned Hall also proposed uh, to use the initial value formulation for humanism in order to improve the, 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 um, the, the, the best system approach in, in the human case, uh, relying on the distinction between initial data and, and, and dynamical uh, um, initial uh, hypothesis and, and dynamical hypothesis. So again, relying on, on, on the initial value formulation of physical theories. So all this to, to say that I like your distinction, Antonio, but once you want to articulate concretely what it means, then space-time does play a role concretely in this articulation, concrete articulation of these of these different conceptions. And and what we're saying is is that just that in this um, the, the these articulations need to be to be revised uh, in the in the quantum gravity context because because the the space-time tool is not there anymore. That's the idea. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Daniele, do you want to? In a sense, it fits with what uh, the, the general point we made earlier that uh, if you're able to specify what you mean by things and then you are able to specify what you mean by going on uh, without using time or space, 
then yes, then you have you have the correct uh, ground for uh, addressing the issue of laws and taking a position in one direction or the other. Also in the quantum gravity case, uh, that's what somehow what we meant by you know you have to clarify the ontology. And, and yeah, I see, I see. So I think we are largely in agreement. So that's that's okay. So thank you very much. Oh.